Well, I have to admit, I'm glad that that flower not fell on the altar because that's actually the flower that I was supposed to say is in honor of the birth of my second grandson, <laughs> Caspian Santiago Hernandez. So uh, I completely forgot. So when it knocked over, I was like, oh, oh, that's what. Oh, yeah, I forgot. So those are good things. Those are good things. <clears throat> the first and only time I ever drove a tractor was in 2006. I was serving a little town in Kaiser, Wisconsin, Norwegian Lutheran Church, Spring Prairie Lutheran Church, it was called. Uh, it had once been a thriving town uh, filled with Norwegian dairy farmers and tobacco growers. Tobacco was a cash crop crop uh, uh, back then. There were two grocery stores in town where you could buy uh, the stuff that you speared the tobacco with and wrap the leaves and so on. By the time I was uh, there, the only thing that was left of the tobacco uh, industry uh, farming were the tobacco barns, you know, where they open the doors so the wind can blow through and the t tobacco can cure before it goes. I don't remember the numbers specifically, even though I was told them many times. Something like 50, 25, or 25, 50, or something, the number of cows you needed to milk and the number of acres you needed to farm in order to feed a family. 50 seems like too many acres, but in any case, we all know that back before the advent of huge tractors and needing to have vast tracts of land in order to have a, a working farm, there was a time when family farms thrived. Think of the past, when much of the population, much of the population was connected in one way or another to what we now call the farm economy. It was more of a farm lifestyle. Where I grew up in California, my parents pick cotton and trade grapes. Uh, my grandfather, Grandpa Garland, was the, ma the uh, business manager of Di Giorgio Farms. Some Italians owned a, a farming interest in the San Joaquin Valley, and there was a little town that had its own school, its own church, its own post office, uh, and the whole community farmed, big farms then. Uh, my great-grandfather, Grandpa Mac, we called him. He ran the mule barn. Yeah, you should have seen that guy's arms. The whole time I knew him, he was on crutches. Uh, he had bad hips and hip replacements, but his arms always remind me of Esau, you know, just filled, looked like a lamb's wool, and it was like, he's a guy who could make mules behave, you know. Even three generations ago, just three generations ago, really big uh, 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 fields that need to be plowed still used horses and mules, draft horses, because the cost of the machinery was, well, the machinery wasn't developed like it is now. Um, I had a view of the difference from Ron Sharpie's combine in 2006 uh, when I went out to combine some wheat. Yeah, it was so boring. He said, I remember Ron saying, oh yeah, you gotta go slow. There's a lot of material with wheat. You know, it takes, you gotta just. So, so he had me come back to harvest corn and then you can go kind of fast when you, when you harvest corn. It's kind of fun, kind of fun. But, but when you're st uh, sitting up in the combine, you, you s sort of learn the same thing that I learned uh, when I was compared to bicycling and we were riding with our tires real close, to keep your balance and to keep a straight line, you have to look off in the distance. If you look down, you lose your balance and you go all crookedy and then you're in trouble. Uh, yeah, you waste fuel, that's not a good thing. I don't imagine there are many of us here who have driven tractors much above lawn tractor. How many of you have driven a farm tractor? Raise your hand. Oh, get out of here. No fair. All right, you're going to have to tell me your stories later. But everyone in the Quad City uh, has heard the story of John Deere and the steel plow, said to have been invented in 1837. 
According to legend, the John Deere steel plow solved the problem created by the cast iron plow's failure in the loam soil. It sort of gathered st stuff up on the plow. And thus, an industry was born. A little over a hundred years later, after the invention of the steel plow, John Deere's granddaughter, Catherine Deere Butterworth, donated funds uh, for what was at first called the Charles H. Deere and Mary Little Deere Memorial Chancel, which features a plowman gripping a John Deere steel plow. Do you get it? It's a little odd, isn't it? A plow invented approximately 1,837 years after Jesus told the parable, is in the window with the sower of the parable that Jesus told. It, it's, it's anachronistic, isn't it? To have a steel plow in the window with the parable of the store. And yet, perhaps because of our distance from working on family farms, uh, this anachronistic John Deere plow can help us understand what we find Jesus saying in Scripture today when he says, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Putting a hand to a steel plow drawn by a horse or a mule was nothing at all like climbing into a climate-controlled tractor cab that cost a fortune, firing up an engine, dialing in the GPS to make sure that you plow straight lines. And, as was the case with the many farmers that I, I have known in the past, who also work day jobs, they come home to plow the fields at night and flip on the light and light up the whole field so they can plow at night. <clears throat> you can't do that when you're pulling a plow behind beasts. The one who put a hand to a plow 200 years ago, let alone in the ancient times of Jesus, would have risen early to prepare the animal to pull the plow, hitching the plow in the gloaming dawn to return no later than sunset if the animal was not already exhausted by the labor. The amount of time and work the plowman could do was limited by the endurance of the animal. And when the animal was working and the plow was moving, nothing whatsoever could break the farmer's focus because the time he was able to work was limited by his physical endurance, the care and condition of the animal, and the duration of the light. I'm not sure whether ancient farmers made straight lines, long furrows like we see today, but I can tell you from my brief experience that it's not easy to keep a straight line. You've got to keep looking off in the distance, something ahead of you, focusing on that. If you look right in front of you, your line gets all wonky and it doesn't make any sense at all. Truth be told, Jesus teaches a lesson on focus and vision, time, and a lesson on the freedom of limits. He points to the plowman as an example of what it means to be a disciple and to work for the kingdom of God to demonstrate the kind of focus, vision, and limits that prepares for the seeds of the kingdom to take root and grow, to produce for the harvest. We all know very well what it is like to be pulled in many directions, to feel constantly distracted, to feel like we have limitless options, to be expected to work around the clock, to be available 24-7, and yet Jesus says to be fit for the kingdom means focusing on the work right now in the limited time we are given, keeping a straight furrow by focusing on the horizon to which we are surely headed. There's a creeping sense of distraction that the plowman could not have allowed, and the seed of the focus that causes Jesus to point to him helps us see the changes we need to make to regain the focus we need if we are to make the most of the time we are given in this life, not to do ever more, not to be more efficient, 
not to better manage our calendars, to sleep less, but to narrow our focus to what matters most and there to find true freedom as we accept our own limits and the limits of others and trust in God's unlimited kingdom of love, forgiveness, compassion, and care. Wendell Berry, a naturalist, conservationist, po poet, and notorious curmudgeon, may help us see it, see it differently. He farmed in Kentucky, and in time he came to give up all mechanical farming equipment. He refused to use tractors and pesticides and herbicides. He farmed with mules and used his noble pen to advocate for rural life and family farms. Barry says that mechanical farming makes it easy to think mechanically about the land, about the creatures, and about ourselves. He says the tirelessness of tractors brought a new depth of weariness into human experience, the cost to health and family life, which we have not fully accounted for. I've searched in vain for the first Wendell Berry article I read, which tells the story of him hitching up the mules to the plow in a field and the way it felt for him to walk behind it on the land he was plowing, to experience its contours, to talk to the mule along the way, to account for the personality of the animal, to feel at the end of the day the mule pulling toward the barn, to know most of all that the time he had to work the fields was always limited. Each part of the story is about connection, relationship, to land, to animals, to time. When you can't simply put more fuel in the tractor or turn on the lights, the nature and the shape of, of time and work is altered. We often run our lives as if we can simply put more fuel in the tank, flip on the lights to work in the night. We often fool ourselves into believing we have limitless time and energy, but we are not machines. We have to choose how we will employ our limited energy, resources, and time. Wendell Berry says, hell hath no limits. We imagine freedom to be the escape of all restraints. And yet, it is through restraints and limits that we find true freedom. We set our friends free by our love for them with the implied restraints of faithfulness and loyalty. Jesus points to the plowman as an example of singular focus and attention to time. To follow Jesus is not merely a choice among many other choices. The kingdom of God does not come into being to fit our calendars. It is rather the source of limitation and restraints that connects us to one another, to the world, and to our God. We are plowing for seeds God is planting. Truth be told, we may not ourselves see the crop the harvest, but we are called to put our hands to the plow and focus on the work and to see that our time is always limited, the time we are given to work in the fields of the Lord. Amen.